Welcome and thank you all so much for having us. I'm Tessa. I'm a psychologist in Sydney, but I'm from New Orleans in the US. Thank you so much to Sarah for collaborating on this. Funny enough, we happen to have the same last name, but no, we're not related. So I'll say, hey, y'all, and she'll say. Kia ora. Uh, so I'm Sarah Ledley, and I'm from New Zealand. It's great to be joining Tessa today. Uh, so yes, funnily enough, um, my maiden name is Taylor. So Tessa and I published together a bit. Uh, so you'll see that name crop up too. And hope you enjoy this today. People may need tubes for a wide variety of reasons, and tubes are life-saving and vital. For some children with tubes, it might be temporary, and there may come a time when the original reason they needed it is resolved, and they're medically cleared to start to learn to eat and drink orally or to participate in a swallow study. There's a hospital-based intervention where children worldwide would travel to go to learn to eat and drink, typically for eight weeks. We're going to talk about translating this into homes in Australia and New Zealand. This intervention has 50 years of evidence and research behind it. Sarah and I have also done some research here that we'll refer to, but we'll keep the explanations really simple and not go into details on the data. But instead at the end, we'll give y'all links to all the articles and some resources if you want further details and to our contact information. Feeding difficulties are complex and multiple reasons can contribute. A child might need a tube due to a wide variety of physiological causes and genetic development or metabolic factors like prematurity, allergies, cleft lip and palate, reflux, or breathing issues. Another factor is their learning history and skill deficits. Because they may not have been medically able or allowed to eat or drink, they may have a lack of exposure, practice, strength, and coordination. They may have not learned how to chew, close on a spoon, drink from a cup, or feed themselves. So they don't know how and they didn't get the chance to learn how to practice. Another factor is environmental. For example, a conditioned aversion. They tried to eat and it was unpleasant, like if they vomited, and so it may have been a bad experience. Y'all might have some personal examples like something you ate or drank while you were sick or got food poisoning from that you didn't want to eat or drink again because it reminded you of it. This is also looking at things we can see and change in the here and now, like the behavior of others. So what happens when the child does or does not eat well? Part of assessment is meal observation. So directly watching the child eat and drink. For example, if they refuse, do they get a break from eating and the spoon and food is removed? If they vomit, does the meal end? If they cry, do they get a cuddle? If they spit out, do they get a food or drink they want better and like better. If they cry and refuse, do they get toys or TV to distract them? What happens if they hold food or liquid in their mouth and don't swallow? Before treatment can start, the medical and physical variables in the first category have to be evaluated and treated, and they have to be cleared to safe for treatment. So meaning they can swallow and they've had the necessary medical testing and interventions. We also have to have guidelines from other disciplines, especially for food allergies and swallow safety. Once this first part is resolved, children still may refuse to eat, drink, or participate in meals, or they might not know how, so they need to learn the skills, or a combination of both of those, so they won't and they can't. We work on these factors, giving them encouragement and help to get over the hump of not being willing to try or participate so that we can help and teach them to learn and practice mealtime skills. Many children could do this if they are safe to swallow and we know which foods and drinks are allergy safe for them. The good thing is that this treatment works regardless of the original cause, diagnosis, disability level, or tube status, which is what was shown in this article from the hospital that I have up on this slide. The data that Sarah will present first are exclusively with children with tubes. However, mine are a mix of feeding difficulties just due to the referrals I get here because parents aren't yet aware that these services are available or don't realize their child's a candidate. So first, I'll briefly describe the logistics of how the home programs work and what the treatment entails. And then we'll show some of the goals and amazing achievements that can be met. So saving the best bite for last. 
I'll try to simply describe the background of the program and what can be achieved, but keep in mind, families need professional help to do this. This is not meant to be a how-to. And professionals also have to have the highly specialized training and expertise from the hospital I came from, even in making sure the pretreatment clearances needed by the other disciplines are done adequately so that we know when treatment is safe to be started. Something to point out specifically with tube feeds though, is that they're gradually reduced to match the increases that are made in oral intake. So this treatment does not rely on hunger to work. Although this is similar to how it's done for children without tubes when they have preferred foods or liquids that they're on. So we don't ask parents to remove them all cold turkey or alone without help. We help to set up a meal time structure and routine. For example, making sure that the child is not full before they start their meals. We weigh everything in grams and graph it. Before, during, and after this process, we work with other disciplines from the child's existing team as needed. The treatment starts in the home setting. Towards the end of the program, we can do cafes, restaurants, childcare, schools, relatives' houses, and family and sibling meals. On breaks, the families can go and get some outdoor time, like going to the park or to the store, rather than being inside a hospital. The program is short term, meaning just weeks, and intensive, meaning many brief practice opportunities all throughout the day every day, so that practice can make perfect. The intensity has to be appropriate to the child's needs and severity of the feeding difficulties, and it has to work quickly given the critical nature of feeding issues. So how many weeks it takes depends on the child's individual needs and progress. Because we work with only one child at a time, there's tons of flexibility in the schedule for the family. We work directly with the child to find out specifically what works for them before having parents try things or giving them recommendations. Once we know exactly what works for that particular child and they are succeeding, we start to work on gradually getting ourselves out of the picture and helping the parents to do it by themselves. The amount of parent support in the training process is huge. It's also step-by-step, step, so we're right there with them uh, at first and practice together. When I'm with a family and they start feeding without us, they are my life. We're on call the whole time. We run in early or after hours if needed, Skype in directly if needed, whatever they need. During the first couple weeks for follow-up after the program, we look at the plate pictures and videos for every meal that the family does. So we don't start off with a big steak and salad. The starting point is individualized for each child depending on their feeding status, the assessments we've done, and their choices and participation, as well as input from the parents and other providers. We first do assessments directly with the child so they can make choices of the targets and incentives. We keep doing this throughout, and I'll give you an example from my last case on the next slide. As with tube tube reductions, increases are gradually made and are data driven. This is tailored specifically for the child based on their individual starting point in progress and small changes are made fast every meal if needed. There's a huge skills teaching piece of this in learning how to do the mealtime skills like chewing, cup drinking, and using utensils. Because even if they're hungry, they may not know how and they may need lots of help to start and learn. We do the teaching during the context of a real meal with actual materials and food and drinks. This is the example from my last case. He made choices so that we got an order hierarchy, both for his favorite things to earn, that's the top row of the picture, and what he wanted to work on from the easiest, more preferred things to the harder, less preferred targets, the bottom row of the picture. We repeated the choices and orders before every meal. And you can see how there's number icons on some of the plates. So he got to see how many he had to do. And we gradually increased those numbers over time and then got into numbers on all the categories. He also got to choose which bites or drinks on that plate he took. He earned his favorite things for the harder, less preferred targets and on down the line. After five days, he had reached 50, over 50 foods, actually consuming, chewing, and swallowing them from all the food groups, including cup drinking water and taking medications. Before the program, he was dependent on a baby bottle and three-month-old baby pouches. The idea behind the treatment is looking at meals from the child's perspective and putting yourself in their shoes and focusing on simple things that we can see and change. 
What is their motivation? What do they want and what do they get? What happens before, during, and after good versus negative mealtime behavior? And how can we flip that around to increase their success so they're getting what they want for eating and drinking rather than for refusing and crying? We can simplify this into three general areas we can change to optimize success. The first one is the most important part. They don't wanna eat or drink. They have to have the right help and prompting to safely get over the hump to practice and learn. It's very important to get the difficulty level right for that particular child and the requirements set have to be achievable for them. The more they practice eating and drinking, the easier it becomes for them the more they will like the foods and drinks, and the less they will want to avoid and get out of it. This also includes sticking to clear rules and instructions. Another part is interaction and attention, involving praising when they do well if the child likes it, and not reacting when they aren't doing well. So not reacting or talking about mealtime problems, staying calm and neutral, not showing them if you're frustrated or upset, not telling them off, reprimanding, fussing at them, coaxing, comforting, threatening, or bribing them. Another part is incentives and rewards when they do well rather than when they aren't doing well. We party it up when they succeed and make it really fun. We put on their favorite music and sing and dance. We've had parents wrap new toys as gifts for them to open. We've lit up sparklers. With my last family, the sister picked different activities for special one-on-one -on -one time with her mom, and one of the cutest was uh, them dancing in the rain with an umbrella. With preferred foods and drinks, instead of filling up on them before meals for free, after they finish the required plates for the meals, they can choose to have more of the foods and drinks they want in small, in small amounts so that they can earn their favorites. Same thing with electronics like the iPad and the TV. The amount of incentives has to be matched to the difficulty level. And as meals get easier, they've faded out, phased out and simplified so that they can have a more natural meal. Again, the first part, the meal requirements and help is the most important part of success. The other two, the praise and incentives, make it more enjoyable and provide motivation and encouragement, but most kids still won't eat or drink for praise and incentives alone. Now I'll turn it over to Sarah. Thank you, Tessa. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some New Zealand based research in this area uh, that's focused on working with children uh, dependent on feeding tubes and providing the intervention uh, that Tessa has essentially described. Uh, so this is a study that was published a couple of years ago and involved nine children, uh, all dependent on feeding tubes, um, a wide range in age, so as young as three and then up to 14 years old. Most of these children were totally dependent on tube feeding, so refusing all food or drink. And then some were dependent on tube feeding for around, say, 50% of their needs, and that was because they weren't eating sufficient volume across enough meals of the day, or their eating was incredibly selective and so not nutritional enough. But these children had been dependent on tube feeding for quite some years and generally had not necessarily accessed uh, an intervention sort of prior to this besides uh, general sort of standard care. All of the children had varied medical conditions um, as Tessa sort of described the complexity in this area and most had disabilities and a number of the children I will say had very limited or no verbal language and also had delays in other skill areas that were obviously affecting eating too. In terms of what was achieved, so Tess is going to talk a little bit more about the kind of outcomes that we closely look at. So all of the children achieved at least some of their behavioral goals, although things we looked closely at in meal times in terms of eating a range of foods across a number of meals. For seven of nine of the children, they met all the goals that we had actually set, uh, with six of those children being able to cease tube feeding and one child having quite significant reduced tube feeds. All of the children had increased body weight and other health, uh, good health indicators. 
Um, and some barriers here we noted, particularly for the two children um, that were not able to cease tube feeding or have those reductions. One child was hospitalized sort of throughout the study and prevented the intervention being able to take place and progress. And for another family, they didn't feel yet ready to sort of make the steps to sort of reduce tube feeds. And for that child, there was a lot of other sort of medical barriers in place too, which made things difficult. But I will say that things tended to take longer, particularly for older children. So these are children that were already in school and had a lot of sort of other daily commitments and things like that. Sometimes it was hard for families to sort of get the steps in place to sort of make that shift from tube to oral feeding, or it just took time to be able to make some of those changes around school pick up and drop off and so on. So this research is still continuing in New Zealand. Uh, it is now called the Ready to Eat study. Generally, we are seeing younger and younger children now when they start, so commonly under two years old. And what we're noticing in comparison to the children that were in this published study is that things are progressing much quicker the earlier that we start. One of the things that also took place in relation to this study and that we've continued to work on uh, is the importance of looking at health professional as well as caregiver involvement and feedback. So Tessa will have described that to some degree in terms of how we work with other health professionals in this process to guide treatment as well as caregivers and families guiding treatment too. But we also look at their feedback. And so a couple of different ways we've done this is kind of numbers based where it's surveys and sort of rating in terms of say questions. So how did you feel about sort of the treatment goals? Um, strongly sort of satisfied or not satisfied at all. And so highest score possible being seven, generally we get high scores in these areas. And then we've also been looking at getting caregivers and professionals to provide more open-ended comments about their perspectives about this, this treatment as well. And the neat thing that we've been doing now is we've been using caregivers sort of responses and perspectives to now be able to shape what the survey that we provide actually looks like. So the survey is kind of being designed and shaped by these caregivers perspectives unique to the caregivers of children with feeding difficulties. Some further research that Tessa and myself are now doing together is looking more closely at how caregivers feel about the treatment strategies that we use, uh, both before they experience that treatment strategy with their child, as well as after. So looking at whether that changes before and after. We also are looking closely at how feedback might relate to the individual child, say when they came into having treatment, uh, as well as what the outcomes were like for that child and whether it made a difference to say how the caregiver felt about the process. We're also trying to look a little bit more closely about the culture of different families and children uh, that we see, as well as just capturing those unique perspectives. So as you can see here uh, below in these quotes, taking more opportunity to seek out some of these open-ended sort of statements from families, as opposed to just getting a rating, a yes or no, or a number of how things went for them. Uh, but at this point, I will hand back over to Tessa. Now I'll go through goals and outcomes from Australia. First, the target is actual consumption and eating. We check for swallowing and they have to swallow the food or drink for it to count. We look at the percentage they actually consumed. I won't go into the complication of these graphs or show the rest of them, but they show each individual child's performance against where they started. Most consumed nothing before the treatment and consumed 100% on average in less than an hour. The target is eating real foods from all the food groups rather than other foods like desserts, snacks, or junk, and foods that they don't already eat, so novel foods. Before treatment, vegetables are normally the lowest and starch is the highest. Most children reach at least 100 foods, and remember this is actually eating and consuming them, so swallowing. The graph shows the quick increase in foods per day. This one is from a last case in the record where they reached 222 foods, and this was in just over two weeks. The lighter data path is free access choice foods that he chose to eat himself outside of the meals. Once a child is 
in a routine except for restrictions due to allergy or texture based on their chewing ability. You can increase the variety of foods quickly, but in small amounts at first. The food we can use is much better than the food we had in the hospital, and they can eat foods that the family eats, many different cultural and ethnic and home-cooked foods, so they, they can participate in traditions and celebrations and family meals, and foods that they can eat at childcare or school, and even takeout foods, so delivery in restaurants. We take pictures of the plates and show ones they ate. This is an example of starting with small cut up bites, for example, a centimeter squared or a small level spoonful, four bites at a time. And at the bottom, you can see the adaptive pink cutout cups and maroon spoons. Once they're able to have a full meal, I love looking at these plate pictures and having so many memories of those meals. It's such a clear picture of the achievements made. This is a move to learn how to bite off portions of food so everything's not pre-cut up and eat increased volumes and amounts, as well as self-scooping rather than preloaded spoons and using regular child spoons. Same with the drinks, moving from a few milliliter bolus to a full cup and sipping in a full cup in a regular cup. So from adaptive to regular child's gear. And if they're able and there's enough time, larger portion plates. Although as long as there's a base, volume is one of the easier things for parents to be able to gradually increase after the program. Children can move from liquids and baby food to regular texture food. Teaching chewing involve, involves many steps and can take more time and be really difficult. This is an example of a five-year-old with no chewing history at all, had never even eaten baby rust, never used his teeth. He was on completely smooth baby blended food and he learned how to chew in three weeks. On the right is a food texture progression over eight increasingly difficult textures. So from the infant products, the rusk and the puffs to regular hard fruit and veg. He learned all the steps of chewing, reached 109 foods and met 100% of his goals and the parents maintained it to at least a year. Medication refusal can be a huge struggle and can result in longer illness recovery time and further tube and baby bottle dependence. Intervention can include the child more independently taking formula for calories, laxatives, and supplements. Ideally, the need for those would decrease after the feeding intervention because they're eating and drinking better, but it is practice and gives parents a format for when the child might be prescribed antibiotics, cold medicine, or pain relievers. And uh, we practice with a variety of flavors and multiple forms, so thin and thick liquids, chewables and gummies, and delivery methods. So finger fed, spoon, cup, medicine spoon, or medicine cup. A great part of this is that the child can learn to do this independently instead of by syringe by others. Also very important is learning to drink water and learning to drink from an open cup, which is a huge important skill, and to drink from a variety of water bottles. These are all important to decrease the need for the tube. With my last family, both siblings did the program, and actually my next family that I'm working with is a younger sister. I've done this quite a few times now so that the family can eat as similar a meal as possible with the exception of any kind of dietary or texture exemptions. Many times the families realize during the program that siblings aren't eating as good as the child that we're there to help. It's normally way easier and shorter because they're younger and there's a real need for focus on early treatment rather than a wait and see approach, thinking that they'll grow out of it or focusing on deciding what to call it. At the hospital, our average age was around two and we saw kids even younger and this is in comparison to the referrals we get here. We work on meals out and procedures for other caregivers, such as grandparents and nannies. So as I said before, meals at a cafe and restaurants and schools and daycares and things like that. Children can learn to feed themselves, use utensils, scoop the right bite size and drink independently. Also, many parents have a goal of wanting the child to eat and participate in the meal without electronics, such as the iPad or the TV. So they want them to finish the meal more independently and quicker without needing distractions, as well as to sit at the table for meals and to stay seated during the meal. 
Feeding difficulties are paramount and impact almost all er other areas of the child's life and the family's life. So getting treatment for it can have rippling effects. Parents report improvements in many other areas such as their hair, their skin, their immunity, socialization and participation in things like sports and being able to travel, their sleep, their tooth brushing, toileting, learning, and behavior. It's such a special journey to go through this with the family. And we love getting updates and pictures and pictures from the family after the program too and hearing about the kids being able to go overnight to camp for the first time, eating on a plane, eating their first birthday cake, getting out of nappies, our parents getting compliments on how well the child is eating from others who aren't aware of what they've been through to get there. Thank y'all so much for having us here and for your time. Here are links that have full articles and some easy to read and watch resources. And here are our email addresses. Thank you.